I'm Philip. I'm working. I'm a software engineer. I'm working for Nextjournal. I was uh, involved with Scriptaculous and Prototype <laughs> back in the days, so never forget. <laughs> but that's pretty much Internet Stone Age by now, I guess. So I'm also co-founder of a little coffee shop here in Vienna. So if you love coffee, check us out. But um, I'm mainly focused uh, on building Nextjournal these days. So. Nextjournal aims um, to make research more uh, reproducible, and we uh, we try that by basically providing uh, a writing environment that's also a live programming environment. So a Nextjournal article basically contains all your your data, your code, and the results of that code if it's being run, and it can be uh, published as an interactive document if you want to. So let me just show you real quick how that works. If it works, yeah, right. So you can basically just type text. You have like nice markdown auto completions for that. You can drag in files, just parses the data, finds out what's in there. Then you could, you can basically, um, you can add programs in there. You can reference uh, the contents of a file and do stuff with it. So I basically just got some values out of the CSV file I dragged in, and I can add another. Uh, code node where in another language, like Elixir, and just uh, grab the values from the code node above. Like here we see the blue extractions, and do something to it. So I just shifted that by one now in Elixir. And then I can maybe just plot both of them using another language like Julia again. So I add a Julia node, um, just reference both values again. So that's the uh, extractions from the first node um, above, and then there's uh, the shifted values from the, from the second node, and then it just renders out a graph. And it's fully interactive. And the whole thing is also fully responsive. So if you just change a value over there, uh, the graph changes down there. Uh, so yeah, I guess you get the idea. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's next journal. Uh, and today uh, I want to talk about Tools for building. So it's basically a journey uh, that we took, uh, or, or describing the journey that we had building Next Journal in the last uh, months. So, as you all might know, uh, it's pretty easy to start uh, a JavaScript project these days, right? <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> anybody read that piece? So that's Jose Aguanagas. How does it feel to learn JavaScript? Anybody read it? Like, yeah, can you yeah, raise your hand? Yeah. Right. So I think it's quite funny. Um, I mean, lot, lots of it is exaggerated. <laughs> yeah. A lot of it is exaggerated, of course, but um, I think a lot of it rings true as well. Um, I'll, so we're not using any of this stuff anymore. So that's mentioned in the article, <laughs> except React, that is. But we. We pretty much left uh, the JavaScript ecosystem by now, and I must say it feels pretty great. So, so we use we use ClojureScript instead. Like we're we're in the ClojureScript ecosystem now, and all of the frontend for uh, for the demo that you just saw. So we built it in ClojureScript in the last three months, and uh, I must say it was like a really really great developer experience for us. So we came in knowing nothing about it, and um, it just was really turned out to be really valuable for us. Um, so for some context, so that's a happiness graph. <laughs> um, so <laughs> we're, we're developing web apps for like over 10 years now or so. So I guess we started around the time where Prototype and Scriptaculous was popular. It was it were the hippie years. <laughs> but um, so the, the, the thing about, about that time was um, there weren't many build tools uh, that you had to take care of, especially as a as a as a front end developer during that time. And even though like you you couldn't get some of the benefits that you can get today, it was a very pragmatic time because most of of, the, of that time revolved around actually building features. And the things that you that you use, the tools, they weren't give you any anything in in particular, and that was a good thing. So it was very little that they gave you. But this uh, scarcity basically made it easy to focus on, on building actual features instead of like focusing on 
the next tool in your build chain or something. So and from there it kind of like um, uh, got uh, dragged down a little bit basically. So you, 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 you see around like 2013, the build chain starts to get uh, larger. We were using underscore backbone. There was already a trans, uh, transpiler. We used CoffeeScript back in the days. There was there were already a package manager. We used um, Bower, and from there it went down and down basically. So I, I, I mean, like in in 2015, it's not that you don't get anything for, from for for these uh, decisions that you make. It's just that incidental complexity kind of increases, and you don't really. Um, it wasn't a, a conscious progress. You just end up in a situation where you have all of a sudden the build chain kind of like creeping into your every day. And I mean, I've heard lots of stories of people spending a week just like getting Webpack to work. And like at some point, you know, you just do it. You, you don't reflect anymore about um, why you do it. <laughs> you just want to get through. And so in, 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 by the end of 2015, we, we said, basically, screw this. So we're going to leave this ecosystem, and we turned over to Elm. And it was just, it was really great. It was just plain great. So Elm was this thing that it's statically typed. Um, it uses something called the Elm architecture. You're pretty sure you know this from Flux and Redux. It has this really nice error messages. It's just a very humane thing. It's something that the whole development process revolves around being nice to you. And this just felt great after like the years before that. So um, we were pretty happy with Elm. And uh, we thought, let's use it for NextJournal. And uh, so NextJournal is this big content editable app at the moment. And we thought maybe we could use Elm to basically drive all the JS frameworks for handling content editable and all the plugins that we use. And we're also using Code Mirror and other stuff. So we thought maybe that's that's how we could make it work. Uh, because we didn't want to, to um, build that stuff in Elm ourselves. But um, before we knew it, um, we ended up with 50 and more ports. So ports are these escape hatches that Elm uses uh, to let you interact with JavaScript. And I think it's a, it's, it's a great way of handling this, but if you end up with 50 plus ports, you, it feels like you're doing it wrong. And that was just, you know, that was the tip of the iceberg because we, we, we didn't integrate a lot of libraries by then. So we, we said, okay, maybe, maybe, we have to, maybe we have to get back to the JavaScript world and like make it work somehow, you know? And yeah, as you see, I mean, that's the, that's the red dot there. It was, after, after being in, in, in the Elm land, it felt even worse to be back there because we had all these things coming back to us and we, we didn't want it. And we, we tried to make it work over, I mean, maybe two and a half months or something. And then we said, okay, <laughs> we, gotta, we gotta screw this. Like, <laughs> it's not gonna work for us. So um, we were searching around if we could, what we could use instead. Thought about maybe, maybe, give TypeScript a try and kind of like hope that the build chain doesn't creep in too much. But instead, a, a good friend recommended ClojureScript to us. And if you just hear him or if you just hear people that use ClojureScript talk about it, it sounds like this best thing. But um, then you, once you start researching it, you hear that it's using the Google Clojure compiler, that it's a Lisp. And then you end up with that it's using the JVM, and then you then you then you see these things. Then you hear it's using prefix notation. It's having all these these parents that kind of like uh, I don't know uh, accumulate <laughs> at the end of a function. And you think like like especially coming from Ruby and CoffeeScript and Elm, you think like really? I mean, it's 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 2016. It, it feels like. It just feels strange, it feels alien to you. But um, the guy was pretty convincing and, and, and we said, okay, let's give it a try. And I must say like the benefits that we, that, we, that we reap from that, they were like really amazing. So we didn't expect any of this. So it was like a five minute process to set everything up. So like given Java is installed, it, 
basically it took us five minutes to get to get everything up and running, and that already included hot code auto reloading, CSS auto reloading. It just was a really great experience. So we were using this this thing called FigWheel, and it just makes the whole development process really nice. So especially after coming from from Webpack, I don't know, like maybe things are better now, but implementing hot code reloading in a big app can be pretty painful at times. So it took us 30 more minutes to set up uh, SCSS auto reloading, and that basically was our build chain. So it all worked. So and I must say, so the parents they kind of disappeared after a week. So that was fine, and <laughs> we never crossed the JVM once. So there's only boot up time. So it, it takes like a couple seconds for the JVM to load up, and then it disappears. You don't. You never see it again, or at least we didn't see it as of, as of now. You also get a lot of other nice stuff. You know, if you ever used immutable chess, like all of, like closure script data structures, they are immutable. And if you if if you compare these two things, it's very concise. It's I think it's it's actually very friendly, and it's also a, a, about a magnitude faster. Which is also really nice. It's, you get all and you get all that for free. That's not a library or something that you include. That's a language construct that's built into the language. And it has really great JavaScript interop. And that really, I mean, that made the deal for us. It's it's like we we have to integrate with all these different libraries at some point, and it has this seamless JavaScript interop and a very reason, reasonable syntax for it too. I think so. If you just look at this, you have. You can you can reference, or you can call functions uh, from JavaScript. You can instantiate new stuff, like um, you can reference um, properties from JavaScript objects. You can get like arrays at a certain index. You have everything you need. You have there, and you can seamlessly convert between uh, from ClojureScript to JavaScript or vice versa. So it, it it all just works. It was pretty amazing, and it's also a really nice functional language, I must say. So, so in, in the beginning, the parents kind of seemed weird, but I think they, and also the prefix notation, but I think um, I st I'm starting to appreciate it now. So it's this, this thing that kind of, for me, reduces a lot of cognitive overhead. So with infix operators, that was something that bugged me sometimes in Elm. So you never know, or sometimes you don't, know what it does exactly. So there's no question what 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 it how like how calling a function is structured. You also you always have like the the function name and then you have its arguments and that's how everything works. And I think um, it's also really nice that at times you can call stuff uh, imperatively, especially if you uh, if you have to deal with the DOM, that's something that you really have to do sometimes. And you can just do that. And it's like, so we try to be as pure, as functionally pure as possible, but sometimes we use these escape hatches and it works really well for us. So, and we are also using a thing called reframe. So reframe is, um, it's basically um, the Elm architecture um, for ClojureScript, but, uh, and it uses a thing called a reagent, that's a, a, like a thin React wrapper. Um, and it's also something that made it really easy for us to kind of like, Get in and start. So there's other things like Ohm and Ohm Next now. So we're actually in the process to like migrating everything to Ohm Next. It's all, it's really really nice. But I think if you're coming from the JavaScript React ecosystem, Reframe is really something that that uh, makes it very easy to just start. So just showing you some some like this is a this is a complete. Uh, Reframe app. So I mean, it, it omits the requires at the top, but um, if you're familiar with uh, re uh, like with Redux or, or the flux pattern, um, you just have some initial state up there. Um, you have an initialize that kind of like takes the initial state and populates your your uh, your app state with it. You have uh, something that it's called. Uh, Rack event here. It's something that reads out something from your state, uh, and then there's 
um, oh sorry, that's something that um, that writes something to your to your state, and then you have something called uh, rec sub that, that you can just subscribe to, and it has these things called uh, reactive atoms. So you can just make a subscription to that, and whenever that value changes, your function is basically being uh, rerun. So then you have uh, a few, and you see in that few we just subscribe to to that count, and whenever you click a button in that few. It uh, dispatches a new uh, state that's being transferred to your app state, and your view re-renders. And the last bit there is just something that um, allows you to uh, to call that run function from your from your JavaScript code. But if you use um, if you use the fig wheel um, reframe template, it does that for you automatically. So, um, and it, there's also ways to uh, have like um, more direct interaction with uh, with React. So if you ever need to do that, it also exposes all the React callbacks, and you can just hook in there and do your stuff. Yeah, we had a we had a pretty good experience with Reframe. Um, there's also the closure compiler, uh, which is pretty neat, I must say. So it's this thing that um, I was pretty afraid of because um, it's big and it's kind of like um, it sounds enterprisey. And I don't know, I heard a couple horror stories, but um, um, I thought like it's actually truly like industry strength because Google is using it for all of their stuff. So it, they're using it for maps. So I think that actually builds trust. I think that's a good thing. And it, it has these features like uh, code splitting and dead code removal in there for a long time already. It does it automatically. So that's something I think Webpack tries to do in version two to some degree, but um, it's, I think it's just plain amazing that this thing is out there and it does all this stuff already. And there's also, um, I mean, that's still alpha at the moment, but um, you're also going to be able to require CommonJS and uh, AMD and uh, ES6 modules, which I think is a great thing because you can truly um, integrate with the rest of the JavaScript ecosystem if you want that. So <laughs> there's uh, <clears throat> there's something that I have to mention at this point. So um, the closure compiler, it uh, like if you want to have uh, that code removal and the really nice optimizations, it has something that's called advanced compilation that provides that. And if you use external uh, JavaScript libraries, you have to provide externals for that. That's basically a way of telling the Closure compiler to not strip away those externals, uh, sorry, those external libraries, because you have to you have to to show the compiler um, the functions that you actually need. Um, but we we found this uh, project called Closure Script uh, JavaScript which is a, basically a repo that's packed with uh, uh, pre-packaged uh, popular JavaScript libraries. So if you use code mirror, um, you just like it's a one-liner to include this, and you have all these externals provided to you. So you, have, you don't have to deal with this anymore, so if you use them. I mean, at some, sometimes this can be a trap as well, because we stumbled uh, upon a package that, that, that didn't have uh, a valid externals file, but it was still in that repo. That can be pretty hard to to figure out. But um, we had it once, so for all the other libraries that we're using, this works really well. It's a very convenient thing. And um, the only other uh, the only other thing we ever had with ClojureScript are uh, its error messages. I mean, especially after coming from Elm, this can be painful. Like Elm is so good that the contrast to the closure script error messages is just drastic. But this is also something that uh, we acclimated to after a week. So in the beginning, we felt it doesn't make much sense, or it just like it gives you these long strings that, you, that, that look like something truly went wrong with the runtime, but it's just like how the error messages look like. And after a week or so, it works. It's not beautiful, but it works. So um, there's a project called Closure Error Message Catalog. I'm not sure where it's going, but it seems like it's trying to find a way to make the error messages nicer. 
I'm not sure how they're gonna do it, but it's something I look forward to. And there's also the closure script project that we just heard from uh, from David, and um, that's also something I'm really looking forward to. So it's like, especially the better error reporting part. So I just heard that uh, the like Bruce Hauman, the creator of FigWheel, which is like this awesome uh, developing tool that provides hot code reloading and, and these things, um, that he actually uh, experiments around with uh, closure spec and tries to show you some nicer error messages for the things that use closure spec. So it's really something I'm, I'm very much looking forward to. And so, yeah, summing up now. So it's actually all coming back to that graph again because um, I came to realize that I'm actually most happy when the build tools stay at the edges of my system. So I, want, I don't want to have them a prominent role, actually. So I'm most happy when I can just do my work and focus on new features and don't have to deal with all this, this stuff that, 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 that's not essential to the features all the time. And coming into the Clojure ecosystem, I found out that's a very mature ecosystem. So it's something that, that has great build tools. They're very reliable. They're very easy to set up. So there's a lot of like fear stories out there that you that I really uh, hope you dismiss. It's really something that's worth trying out, and it's something that makes that helps us a lot, like making our products better. Thanks.